Hey everyone, this is Boba Trainer, and as I promised, I am here with a nice, solid analysis slash theory video. Last week I made a video with Prima Diva, which you can find linked in the description. I was really happy to collab with her, and I think we made a pretty awesome video, and I cannot thank her enough for having me on her channel, so if you haven't checked it out yet, you should. While you're there, stick around for more of her videos, you absolutely will not be disappointed. She's covered unique and interesting theories, and has a series of Spec Evo videos where she looks at how certain Pokemon and types could evolve in the real world, just, just trust me, you'll like them. If you subscribed from that video, then welcome and thank you for checking out my channel. I try to answer questions that have bothered me about the Pokemon world, theorize on how that world compares to ours, and overall try to express my love for the series. This week, I wanted to look at the villainous groups and leaders from the Pokemon games and theorize on their real-world origins and somewhat classify their motivations. For the most part, the various teams we've met have been some of the darkest elements in the series overall, usually, and I thought it might be interesting to look through them and see where the inspirations might have come from and how they compare to one another in terms of wickedness. For this video, I am excluding Team Skull, Yell, and Rainbow Rocket, even if one of those is your favorite, don't click away, I have reasons for doing so. Skull, because they don't really have a complex or long-term goal, and though I think analyzing Guzma would be interesting, not in this video. Yell, because again, they weren't villains so much as occasional annoyances. And Rainbow Rocket, because it's merely a group of the people I'll already be talking about. So, with that out of the way, let's dig into it, and what better way to do this than in order? which means I'll be starting with Giovanni and Team Rocket. Considering some of the events we'll look at later, Team Rocket seems relatively tame. Global domination is occasionally discussed as an end goal, but there's nothing particular displayed in the games that suggests they could actually accomplish it. Anime Team Rocket was involved with Mewtwo and follows Ash around literally the entire bloody world, but Game Team Rocket seems to just like getting easy money and rare Pokemon, ostensibly for more easy money. Team Rocket steals Pokemon, they've killed a Marowak, the bastards, they hijack a radio signal to force Pokemon to evolve, but they also openly run a casino, have a famous extortion bridge to recruit new members, and their boss is a legitimate gym leader. This has shades of real-world organized crime syndicates, most notably the Sicilian Mafia and Yakuza, both of which, while criminal organizations, also have centuries-old traditions and organization that make them somewhat unique. There is Giovanni, the highest boss, and then the underlings that perform the various criminal or legitimate acts, and later, there's a slightly more complex hierarchy with executives, whose very trainer class reminds you that you are dealing with a formal organization. It's difficult to gain an understanding of exactly which activities of theirs are legal versus illegal since the player character is the one who usually foils the plans rather than any actual authority, but the Rocket Game Corner and Giovanni's gym status tells us that at least part of the operation is legitimate, and more importantly, accepted by the community, which may be how they were able to gain control of the Silfco building, which was really just to get Master Balls to make more money. Their in-game, even with their return in Johto, didn't involve destroying people or the world. They're just an organized group of criminals looking for money. Steal Pokemon for profit, exploit Pokemon for profit, all Pokemon exist for the glory of Team Rocket. Interestingly, even though I think the more infamous criminal groups like the Yakuza and Mafia inspire Team Rocket, one of the features of both those groups is an aversion to petty theft, viewing it as indecent and a violation of their social role, but Team Rocket being a simplified caricature of organized crime does not have this taboo. Maybe it's only interesting if you're a nerd. Enter Teams Magma and Aqua, and enter more complexity. If nothing else, these teams are complex because motivations and stories were drastically changed in the remakes, but let's see if I can cover both real quick. In Ruby and Sapphire, teams Aqua and Magma want to expand the seas and the land, respectively, to improve the quality of life for Pokemon and humans, respectively. Making a long story short, Team Magma believes that life can thrive better if given more land, while Aqua believes that since water is the source of life, its expansion will be good. It has the same energy as, is there not enough money? Let's print more. In Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, everyone has much more depth to them. 
For one thing, Archie twice refers to keel hauling, which is when a person is dragged across the bottom of a ship where the attached barnacles, um, let's, let, let's just say a significant portion of your body will be left behind. Beyond cruel death sentences, though, we also see evolved motivations. Now, Archie and Team Aqua have the idea that causing humans and land-based Pokemon to become extinct will be better for the world, and Maxie and Team Magma believe that humans can only succeed if they finish taking over the world. And since those pesky oceans get in the way, let's fill them up with dirt! Both are discussing and advocating for mass murder on a global scale, with Team Aqua's plan aiming at the eradication of humanity and land Pokemon, if only implicitly, while Team Magma's plans would wipe out ocean ecosystems. Both leaders, Maxie and Archie, are idealists with incomplete plans. They posed a significant threat to life and civilization, but were able to attract followers who shared their ideas. The concrete goals they had in mind and attempted to enact both would have ended up failing in the long term, though. Archie's idea to raise sea levels to protect the oceans would fail when all of the land-based pollution subtly entered that world ocean, and Maxie's idea to give humanity more land would end up collapsing when the weather patterns and food sources that come from the ocean ended. Neither are necessarily based on any one figure, but there are people and organizations that believe similarly. A lot of people joke about giant meteor, insert election date here, but there are legitimate organizations that believe humans should go extinct to preserve the environment, and there are certainly people who believe in land reclamation and in humanity expanding endlessly. At the core though, these groups encapsulate the debate between civilization and nature, which are often seen as opposing with each group taking an extremist position on one being favored over the other. Team Galactic saw the previous attempts to take over the world and said, Hold my beer, I'm going for the destruction of the universe. Cyrus is an interesting villain, because the scope of his goal and because of how close he actually came to achieving said goal, which brings up some questions about how stable the Pokemon universe is. But Cyrus is also interesting because of his motivation. It's clear he believes that what he's doing will be a positive. His position on destroying the universe, the consequences of which he seems to understand, is that people will die, but that in death there is a sort of peace, and in his new world everything will go better because that world won't have emotions because he'll be its god. In a kid's game about catching cute monsters. Cyrus initially seems to have traits of fascist leaders in his desire for control, but because his end goal involves apotheosis, becoming a god, and a new paradise without suffering, I'd say his influences would stem more from religious movements or cults that became deadly. The idea that the world is suffering too much and the need for a massive change in order to better it is behind many political and religious beliefs, but the extremes that Cyrus is willing to go to his interpretation of the world and emotions, and his nearly fulfilled desire to reach divinity to help create a world that he believes is better, sounds very similar to the beliefs of religious extremist groups like the Branch Davidians and Am Shinrikyo. Saturn even alludes to Cyrus being a charismatic leader, saying that even though he didn't know what was going on, he and others were just enthralled. While not always a negative thing, charismatic leadership is often seen as a necessary trait for religious movements like mentioned above. The commanders themselves have interesting characteristics in that all of them seem to have varying levels of understanding or involvement in Cyrus's overall goal. Okay, so after cults and intentional extinction, Team Plasma seems less outrageous, but Gestus is the first villain to have both a plan and the means to simply take over the world. Simple villain, simple authoritarianism. Team Plasma's stated goal of wanting to separate Pokemon from people may have been a cover for Gestus, but the fact that so many of the members seem to follow because of this, this game's villainous team also calls into question Pokemon or animal rights, which is another example of maybe not so nefarious motivations for the group itself, even if they take the position to the extreme. Their support of N, the ones who weren't aware of Gustus' true plan anyways, could be considered just a political organization. They support a government run by N, with one of the goals of that leadership being humans and Pokemon living separately so that both can be happy. I kind of want to do another video breaking down Team Plasma more completely, because the Sages and N and the Betrayal all seem to have more there, I just don't have space for it in this video. Gestus as a villain can be inspired by any number of authoritarian leaders in the past, since his goal to have the most weapons 
to enforce his rule is textbook fascism. Like I said though, I want to get into this more deeply, so I'm going to move on for now, but I'll be back to peek at the sages again. Finally, Team Flair. Team Flair has some problems. You go in with this leader who has these really dark and twisted motivations about the world getting worse and ending it and draining life forces and starting something new with a select few people. I've seen people liken Lysander in his rhetoric to Nazis, though I think he was pushing more for an Archie-esque people in general are bad for the world vibe. I think there's traces of Rousseau in there, it is based in France after all, and when he's talking about the world becoming uglier, he might be referring to the encroachment of modern society and overpopulation and pollution and aiming for a smaller population living in a state of nature. But then you come to Team Flair as a whole. A bunch of people who are obsessed with fashion and superficial beauty. They're also wealthy since membership apparently costs 5 million pokey dollars, and it just doesn't work out too well. Lysander is flawed, is hopelessly misanthropic and wrong in his conclusions and the means he wishes to achieve them, but comes across as someone who truly believed that he was doing something positive, even at the cost of a great negative, which is why the word sacrifice is thrown around. A tough pill to swallow, but with something better at the end. Team Flair, on the other hand, comes across as spoiled. Their use of the word beauty isn't a metaphor for something else. They're talking about flashy hairstyles, coordinated outfits, dashing poses, and a world that's all that all the time. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world where my hair is a Dairy Queen dipped comb. Now, if Lysander behaved the same way, we could say that Team Flair is a clunky analogy for elitism, or even some quasi-the-purge commentary about how the wealthy might one day try to eliminate everyone else. And that would also fit with the France theme. But since Lysander seems to have more complex ideals, and seems to view the deployment of the weapon as a necessary sacrifice to protect the bigger picture, all of that drama and seriousness compared to Team Flair's petty concerns, seems to not fit too well. I think that's why this team isn't as liked as the others. And so that's it. If you're new here, then you haven't learned yet, but I always end my videos very awkwardly. I don't know how to write satisfying conclusions. But those are my thoughts on the possible origins or inspirations of the villainous teams we've encountered over the years in the Pokemon world. If nothing else, having all of these evil plans laid out in one spot help us compare and contrast. What are your thoughts? Which is your favorite team? Mine is Skull. Would you be interested in me breaking down Team Plasma and the Sages more? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, don't forget to subscribe if you're not already, and if you would like, check out my Twitter account where I post updates about the channel. I will see you all next time. Thank you so much, and please stay safe.